Okay, so uh, today's lab objectives were uh, operate the hyper manager, create virtual hard disks, create virtual networks, which is configure machines and operate them. Uh, so basically, uh, in a private cloud or a public cloud, it's always uh, basically, you know, it comes down to either applications or virtual machines that we are uh, trying to uh, configure. So, uh, but there's virtual switches, of course, uh, then the third net uh, part is uh, networking, but it all comes down to how your virtual machines are handling your applications, uh, uh, especially in the private cloud, and uh, uh, then public cloud as well, of course, uh, people have their virtual machines always up, uh, and they want them up and running. So we need to know the basics of uh, uh, how to configure our Hyper-V. Although uh, the way we are configuring Hyper-V, uh, if we go for its uh, uh, competitors as well, it's the same, uh, uh, nearly the same uh, concept, uh, but some more features uh, for, so Hyper-V has those virtual machines we have configured, then there is a Citrix Zen server, that has nearly the same interface uh, as it's a hypervisor and then ASXi from VMware. Uh, they also have uh, the same uh, hypervisors, right? Uh, and uh, if you see the concepts there, uh, nearly the names are changed, uh, interfaces are changed, but uh, the concepts are exactly the same as they're all hypervisors. So, uh, but we are considering on uh, Microsoft uh, private cloud here, uh, if concepts on one a type of private cloud or public cloud is uh, perfect, then we can uh, always uh, feel uh, at ease to configure any other type of vendors, uh, private cloud and public cloud. So uh, that's why uh, the virtual machines are the basis of uh, all the you know applications and virtual machines. You have to take care of these when we are in a production environment. So that's why uh, the objective's like this, and uh, we're gonna still further configure more options there, and what's the best practices in production environment that we want to configure uh, for private cloud. So if you go ahead a little uh, to open Hyper-V Manager, <coughs> of course, uh, uh, we uh, today it can configure the Hyper-V Manager. If I go ahead a little more, so these are all the options, of course. Uh, we right clicked and these are the common options that we see in any typical application. So uh, new import virtual machine, we did uh, use those options. Hyper-V settings, update or change settings. So Hyper-V settings not only has uh, virtual switch manager, it has other components as well, uh, which uh, we may or may not use, but what we will be using uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot, we have tried to configure those options. So we're gonna go to those options as well, and just to uh, visit and check what is the logic of uh, why did we do what we did today. Uh, so uh, Virtual Network Manager is there, uh, and we created uh, networks there. There, we only created external switch there, otherwise uh, there, and I did put that uh, other types of switches, which is uh, internal and private switches, right? So <coughs> those are the same uh, concepts of switches in ESXi VMware as well. Those who have done VMware course would know that uh, as well. So edit disk, uh, uh, same type of, nearly same type of concepts in ESXi as well. Uh, to uh, edit disk, you can convert, compact, expand the disk. Uh, when you're going for editing a virtual disk. Uh, so inspect disk just tells you what is the information about uh, that disk that you edited or changed information about. Um, overview of actions when running Hyper-V. So stop service, of course, stops the service. Some common options uh, which, uh, uh, so remove server if you want to remove. So if you can add within the console, Hyper-V console, uh, other servers as well. If we just go to the Hyper-V console here, uh, and if you're on the Hyper-V Manager, you can just right click like this and connect to another server. <coughs> so you can add as many Hyper-V Hyper servers here. Suppose you have like 10 or 20 Hyper-V physical servers, and on top of those you're running uh, 20 virtual machines or 50 virtual machines per host. You can add all those from here, right click Hyper-V Hyper Manager and connect to server, and then it will ask, uh, is there any other Hyper-V server? So you can keep on adding within one console, and from here, you can just uh, configure all those Hyper-V servers as well. Uh, so if we go back to the slide here, um, so remove server, add server, all the options, refresh the Hyper-V measure, view, 
uh, new window from here. So all those options are typical application options uh, that uh, we can use. But uh, let's go ahead a little operating Hyper-V Manager, two categories of Hyper-V settings. So there are server settings and then there are user settings. So uh, specif server settings specify the default location of virtual hard disks and virtual machines. So we're gonna see that uh, when we were creating a new virtual machine, uh, there was a path that we needed to give and uh, right now <coughs> we uh, currently give local C drive paths but later we're gonna be attaching it to SAN and to the LUNs remotely configured drives and then we're going to give the path of the, our newly created virtual machine to that uh, LUN. Uh, so uh, right now uh, server settings, that's where the default path is and every virtual machine will land there. And user settings, customize interactions with virtual machine connection, provide access to the desktop of a running virtual machine. So, and to change settings, Hyper-V settings in the Actions pane, you can go there. If I just visit this area quickly, uh, just for the record of the video, uh, so uh, we can just put it there. So, uh, if you right-click Server 02 there, and uh, go for Hyper-V settings here, uh, we can see all those uh, options here. So, uh, this is written server and the user options, right? So server has, of course, all the main configurations, live migrations, which we will be doing later, physical GPUs for applications with, uh, you know, uh, graphics, a lot of graphics being used, so you should have physical GPUs there, processors uh, for those uh, applications that have uh, Photoshop uh, and any other video services. So NUMA spanning is again, uh, uh, memory is given directly or is given more direct access to virtual machines. Uh, but we're gonna be talking in detail as well for this NUMA spanning. But they all come inside Hyper-V settings under the server options, right? Uh, virtual machine, <coughs> excuse me, path is there and uh, live migrations, replication is there uh, and storage migrations is there. So these are some of the uh, advanced stuff that we're going to do later in the course. And if you have done well, these, and if you have understood live migrations and replication, of course, uh, this is the same that goes on the cloud as well. Uh, if we are running virtual machines there and on any other vendors like VMware or Citrix, then servers, virtual machines, you have the same concepts, it's just different names there, right? It's vMotion there, live migration here. Uh, replication, it's here, uh, fault tolerance there, right? It's the same concept uh, and different interfaces. Uh, so uh, these are advanced server settings, then there are user settings that uh, are related to just enhanced session mode when users are connected to virtual machines, keyboard and mouse settings, and any other checkboxes you want to reset or change the settings for. But uh, this is just typical server and user uh, related settings. Uh, we will be, of course, concerned with mainly server settings here, right? So, uh, and later we're going to be configuring a lot of other server settings. Uh, so, let's go ahead a little. So the two categories here, then we go for operating Hyper-V manager, <coughs> excuse me. So Hyper-V settings on the host server, uh, virtual hard disks, uh, settings are saved in this path. So we today created that. Virtual machines, we can create that too. And they have a de separate default uh, folder paths. And then there is that NUMA spanning enabled by default. NUMA is a memory design used in computers that have multiple processors, but basically NUMA means uh, virtual machines is trying to get uh, more access to the memory than uh, is given to them. But NUMA is coming as a in-depth topic as well. Uh, uh, but this is right now a, a brief uh, introduction to uh, Hyper-V settings and uh, overall uh, what we are going to be using later, and this is the basis of that. If we go ahead a little, operating Hyper-V manager user settings that can be modified in Hyper-V, so yeah, these are just uh, simple settings, keyboard, mouse release, user credentials. Uh, if you want, uh, you know, uh, 50 or 60 or 200 or 500 users are connecting to your Hyper-V, these are settings you won't want to configure there. But if I go for back to these settings, virtual hard disks, virtual machines. So this is what we configured today. If I quickly just go there uh, for reference, uh, right click and new, and we created virtual hard disk and uh, virtual machines there, right? And we not go for floppy disk, of course. Uh, so here, 
uh, Hyper-V settings, uh, if I go back uh, the, under the server settings here, uh, then we have physical GPOs, NUMA here, and uh, others. So by default, NUMA is available. Allow virtual machines to span physical NUMA nodes. Uh, again, we're going to be going in depth with that and live migrations and uh, storage migrations and replication configuration, all those options. We're going to go in depth. Uh, so, so uh, the slide uh, is all about you know uh, uh, trying to be familiar, uh, familiar with the Hyper-V options. And of course, uh, if you're creating a private cloud, Hyper-V is the one thing that you should know, uh, at, you know, better uh, in terms of uh, keeping it uh, alive or highly available. So creating virtual disk, yeah, we did that. A virtual disk can have the same contents as a physical hard disk. It you know, acts like a physical hard disk. Uh, disk partitions can be created in file system. So the virtual disk we created today, uh, that was just a disk, but it can be attached to any vir existing virtual machine, right? Uh, so typically used as a hard disk or virtual machine, yeah, simple stuff. Okay, three types of virtual hard disk supported. Uh, dynamically expanding, fixed size, and differencing. Uh, so dynamically expanding, of course, is like thin provisioning. So uh, you go for uh, whatever you install, it just occupies that space. We did talk about that before. So fixed size, it just occupies the disk right away. If you give the size of 100 GB, it just occupies 100 GB right away on the disk and doesn't let anyone use that. It zeroes out all the sectors and of the disk. So differencing disk and uh, uh, pass-through disk, these are the th two things that we haven't done yet. Uh, we will be doing that, especially the pass-through disk. Uh, so uh, differencing disk, uh, if I just quickly create that, uh, we have talked about that before. So uh, differencing, uh, it shows here, and that was one of the options that we could have selected as well. Uh, and uh, so if you have a virtual machine here, and that virtual machine uh, has one parent disk already. So if I just create that quick uh, parent disk, or the first disk, not errant and parent. Yeah. Parent disk. Uh, it's errant. There's no errant disk? OK. So parent disk, and uh, uh, it's getting full. So the main scenario is uh, that uh, whatever changes we are making, uh, we are, making uh, are getting saved in this disk. So we can just uh, add differencing disk. What does that do? As the word says, it will save the differences, right? So uh, you can add a new disk, and uh, that disk is called differencing disk. What it does, uh, it, yeah. So it saves all the modifications uh, slash differences in the OS uh, made uh, today. So whatever modifications, so suppose you installed MS Office, you installed any application, you made any changes, and configuration changes doesn't make any taking space. So uh, what it does, any software onwards from now on, after the introduction of differencing disk, anything that you install afterwards should be, will be saved in the differencing disk. And uh, what is the basic benefit of differencing disk? It will save uh, space uh, on the parent disk. So uh, automatically, it starts saving the you know uh, whatever changes you have made, any big changes you've added, any uh, database there, or any big software you've installed. It's not going to uh, be installed on top on the parent disk. It's going to go for uh, the differencing disk. Uh, so snapshot is a backup, uh, point in time backup of whatever configuration is in the computer, yeah. which includes maybe parent disk plus differences disk plus as many is maybe there are ten disks there. So it takes a snapshot of the whole thing. Okay, this is, this is it's kind of a different, but suppose if you add another disk, which is not going through the process of uh, differencing this, suppose. Mm -hmm. So uh, it will. you can install software. You have to give the path of that software yes. on that. And you have to define that this disk has to, from now on, every new modification has to be saved here. But differencing this is supposed to do that automatically. So, uh, so 
exactly. So it's going to detect that uh, there is any modification of uh, done today, which is software installation or configurational changes, which is supposed to save on its uh, automatically on the different settings. Yep. Uh, if the differentials is uh, for each stack, I guess for like I said, for second variant, this is the one. Sorry. If the differentials is. Mm. Uh, so can the parent be run by itself or it will still for you to Well, parent is will should keep running itself. But not all the modifications. Modifications, then you will get errors, start Sorry. getting errors. Parent this child is it is like child, but uh, the because of the purpose of this, yeah. it is called differencing because it's supposed to save all the modifications there. Yeah. Sorry? <laughs> yeah. Sir, so the parent disk is basically the master disk, right? Master and slave disk, you can say. You can say. It's not waste of space, it's uh, you're saving the uh, parent disk from filling up. To the end. If it fills up, it's it's gonna stop operating system. So this we can say as a backup, but it backup is another terminology that we use. But we can say it is working as a backup. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Yeah. so even the Sorry? Even the Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's suppose any differences. Uh, performance wise uh, it depends if you have SSD it's going to perform well depends on which type of disk you've added but if it, this virtual disk is placed on top of an SSD LAN it's going to perform well otherwise uh, performance wise shouldn't have any difference it's just that the differences have to be saved on the differencing disk mm -hmm. these are both virtual disks Yeah, we cannot use the exact terminology of a backup on it, but we can refer to it as if it's a backup. Yeah. So, yeah, you're, sorry, you're right about that. As well, backup is like a more confusing word, right? So, saves differences. Well, I, I put that there, but yeah, easy to remember is yeah, as a backup. But backup is a separate you know topic. It's it's not it's not a backup. You can refer to us like a backup. You can say that in an interview. Also, try not to say that, but uh, you can just say that data is saved in a second disk or any modifications or changes you've made. So maybe you don't want to save that. Maybe whatever modifications you did, you may maybe it's not critical. Maybe it's just day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, you've just saved one word file. It's not. But anything you do different yeah. is supposed to save it, right? So backup is taken for critical things. No, yeah. So it's you can say as if. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah, that's why I'm saying that uh, in an interview when you're saying that, so yeah, uh, there, there will be cross questioning. It will start more questions. So, we, but it's it is a backup, kind of. Extra? Re it's not replication. So you, uh, the nearest one would be yes, a backup. It is it is like a backup. Oh, yeah. so that's the nearest. Yep. It's like. Uh, yeah. okay. But the question is, uh, mm -hmm. why do we need to save space on the parent? Why not? Why oh, it's operating system. It has operating system. Others would have just applications. Oh, so the really have the OS, but only the modifications. Exactly. Differencing is any modifications you're doing. So. <coughs> So incremental backups could be run on there, but this is another scenario. You're trying to run on incremental backups on the differencing disk, right? Yeah, so because the difference, like, yeah. I made some changes, and I keep saving those changes mm -hmm. after. Yeah. It's, 
So if you're creating that difference in this, you say, I want to create incremental backup or a difference in that. Uh, so from the backup application, you're introducing uh, differencing backup as well as incremental backup. So backup we have to take for a differencing this anyway. We have to take it anyway. Whatever changes we are making, we have to take a backup. So it's your decision that you're going for incremental. I would go for incremental, uh, but uh, you can choose the differencing, differencing backup as well. It's faster, its recovery is possible. Differencing the recovery is like, you know, it's, it's difficult. Exactly. You're right. Incremental, you can, it, it also removes the logs as well for that, right? Uh, what's mm -hmm. the problem with incremental if it's, if you're using it for a long time, you have to reference back for it? So, the, so it has to be log-aware uh, incremental backup, and some advanced backup applications, uh, their incremental backups are always preferred. Uh, so if it's logs aware and it has, so you don't have to then have way back full backup then. You can still recover. Uh, so this one you can recover on, uh, you don't need, how do you set it as, you don't need to go to a uh, No, last full backup you need. Last full backup you need. Oh, okay. For a, any increment of Yeah, but it has, backup, yeah. Like uh, for example, it's okay, right? You have to have a full backup one so we can then yeah, and it also gets rid of the logs, and it's also recovery is much easier with the incremental than the differencing backup. Yeah, it needs. And it would uh, require just till the last second log file for to recover to them. Exactly. Well, you pretty much said it. <laughs> Well, mm -hmm. take out the disk and re replace it. This is easier to manage. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. How many backups we can have for? Oh, we can have uh, as many. Yeah. All you need to do is go to the wizard and attach it to a proper bin and disk. Go for the other one. Exactly. Exactly. What software? Is there a software? For yeah, anti backup. Anti backup. Oh, the 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 backup software is there. Backup server. It's by the name of backup. Windows backup. Windows backup. It's not anti backup. Anti backup was old. I am so used to that. Windows backup. Yeah, built in application. It does all. It's not that advanced still. It has many limitations. That's why companies go for you know semantic backup and. Production environment, go for third party. It is good for Exchange, SQL, but uh, on a very small scale. Okay. Sir, sir, yes, sir. Incremental backup is everything backs up until to, to, to the next day, and differential is everything backs up until the previous difference. Day. Right? Until the last difference. Yeah. But, but, but how come we started talking about backups? It's a different thing, disk. 
Le Dave Scott. Y... But it's backup. We we will be coming to that in the last. Because we're really off track now. <laughs> so it's all about tagging. It's all about tagging the files. That's why we need to go in there when we're talking about the backup topic. Then we. Will This has to be one. Sad the difference. <coughs> Actually, we just need two discs or three discs. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you could just have a bigger disc. No, you can have as many discs there. You can just whatever whatever disc is previously available, and if you go for the next new disc through the process of differencing. Then it's become differencing. If you just add a new disk, it will also become as like a parent disk, right? If you don't go, go through the process of differencing. Parent, child, then differencing for the child? So uh, when you're adding a differencing, you must have some disk already there. Is it to the child? So child, don't include the child term. So uh, there could be parent disks, there could be two disks that are equally available. Okay. And you can add differencing disk to first disk, differencing disk to the second disk as well. But, yeah. Through the differencing process, whatever you add. Yeah, you're saying? Oh, yeah. No. OK, if, you, if you're if you referring to the disk as a child, um, there is no procedure to make it as a child disk. There's only differencing and uh, compression and uh, dynamic and, you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're referring to master and slave, right? Yeah. So one under the parent can have differencing as well. But when you go for master and slave, it's physical and more. So this is uh, all virtual we're talking about. So so if you have slave, yes, you can add. Yeah. So the obviously Oh yeah, definitely. It has to be. When you're creating the differential disk on the main is that is there any reason how that information is stored? Or does that change? Or does that change? So now we're from yeah. saying different like from different this is all over this looks at the how that address and copy is or does that change how the file the file needs to be um, It's just another VHD you've added okay. to the virtual machine. And that first VHD was on SAN already. And this second VHD will also sit on some SAN run disk, right? So there's no issue with kind of like, no. Oh, we're not uh, No, no, no. It, first of all, it must be rate configuration uh, as a best practice only. But if it is a rate configuration, it doesn't change anything whether you added a differencing disk or not. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, OK. So then there is another, uh, next one is pass-through disk. And pass-through disk is also very, very useful. So this was saving the differences. So parent disk should not run out of space, right? Major benefit of this one was this, that parent disk should not run out of space. So saving all the differences automatically to the differencing disk, right? But pass-through disk, that's another uh, you know, a feature that is very, very useful. If I just go, go ahead and create that on the other. Uh, so this is a server, physical server here. And if we go for physical server, which is physical Hyper-V server, right? So then we have inside virtual machines. So VM1, VM2, and on, onwards, go on. So uh, we go on to that, so VM1. So now what happens is that VM2 needs a lot of performance. So it already has a single disk here, uh, or multiple disks here, doesn't matter. Uh, these all have disks here. But all of a sudden, uh, so suppose it was already having a web server or a print server, which does not take much of the local uh, read and write, IOPS. If I just go for this, it does not take 
So IOPS, input output per second, uh, not IPOPS, uh, IOPS, uh, for the disk read write performance, right? So uh, then your boss decided, decides out of nowhere, hey, we're gonna install here SQL Server. And uh, you're saying, sir, uh, no, uh, why don't we go for a new virtual machine? No, we cannot. For some reasons, you don't have enough virtual machines, you don't have enough SAN disks uh, there, you don't have enough storage, you just want to install on top of any working virtual machine right now. That machine, all uh, you know, all of a sudden, it needs performance now, right? So it needs uh, extensive read operations from the disk. Uh, now, which means that you have to give, so what it does basically, pass through disk, so pass, through disk gives direct access to the raw disk uh, to virtual machines. So virtual machines get direct access to the disk instead of uh, being placed on top of uh, uh, you know uh, a virtual environment or any data store. Actually, I'm mixing <laughs> data store. Data store is in ESX VMware, and there it is called RDM. Here it is called pass through disk. But main thing, the disk reads and writes have to be extensive. So the virtual machine is given direct access to the raw disk to gain that speed for the read and write operations of the application. So that is called pass through disk. And how do we? You mean the raw disk is the physical disk? Is the physical disk exactly? You give direct access for this virtual machine to the physical disk. Direct access. No, it's not a virtual disk. It's a physical disk. It's a whole disk that you added. is totally given to a virtual machine. So it has to be say, It has to be full. Full physical one disk. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you go for that theory, that parent disk or slave uh, child disk, so it could be the second one. We can say. We can say mas if first one is master, second one is slave. Yeah, we can say that. But it's the second disk that you're adding, which is a full disk directly given access to one virtual machine. Uh, yeah. You cannot partition that disk. No. So I'm going to show you now how is it added. Yeah? This machine here, I'm assuming there is a hypervisor 1 setup, right? Mm -hmm. So in the hypervisor 2, we have to get this makes sense. So? Because this is a hypervisor 2. Uh, yes, it has to be hypervisor, definitely. It has to be hypervisor machine. Why? There is OS in the middle, right? That is, but this is hypervisor 2, although, but I'm going to show you now because it's a quick demo and it's a very small lab. So, uh, yeah. But the virtual machine can have multiple disks, right? Virtual machines. Go for virtual disk, and then it can go for a raw disk. Yeah, right. This is a physical disk. Yeah. Performance is required. Application requires disk read and write operations. This so application tries to use the disk as a memory as well. If this is a scenario, exactly. No, we, you don't need that. Because pass-through disk has some limitations. I mean, you're doing a live migration of a virtual machine. With the pass-through disk, which is this machine is uh, you know mapped to a pass-through disk, you cannot do a live migration then, a virtual machine. Or uh, then there are very specific. Live migration means you're putting this virtual machine, you're, you're uh, moving this virtual machine to another physical uh, Hyper-V. So you cannot move or take it away from this hyper -V, even if it's about to go down now. If pass through disk, yeah. Limitations as well. Yeah. 
virtual disk, which we normally are using. But if you need a virtual application, so the on, type, on top of virtual machine, if you have an application that really needs performance, then you, oh, this happens a lot. In production environment, you have you know, no idea at once out of nowhere, okay, install SQL Server here, we don't care how. Just do it and you need to make it work as well. And you need to make it performing as well. So we as system administrators should have that solution ready, right? Whatever is physically possible, we can just say that, draw the map, hey, we just need this much investment. So uh, when I was in uh, Scotiabank there, uh, we had one SSD bought in $18,000. One SSD disk, small disk, for SAN, EMC SAN. So that was 18000 So when we were asking for more storage, the boss showed us the receipt. Hey, this is what it costed us. So can you stop asking me for storage? So that is reality there. So we have to make work this work, right? Yeah. Hmm? No, it's not temporary. It's a. It's kind of you. You will be using it long term. Uh, so this is the risk we are taking. We we system administrators are monitoring it, right? So we're gonna really make sure it is uh, working fine. But there are some limitations and there are some advancements now that you can still migrate a virtual machine and you can create a password disk there without losing any data. No, we're going to. It's just storage right now. Okay, so that's why that's why you can still use not virtualized because maybe you don't need to lock power on the server for CPU memory. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, you need those really bright speeds for the CPU. Oh, yeah. So even if you have very high-end CPU and memory, the read and write speed really makes a difference. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But we're. The reason why you still keep that sort of virtualized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. So otherwise, yes, go for a physical server. I mean, uh, if we have that option, if we have that option, yes, physical server is the best for SQL server and exchange server. We always put uh, exchange server mailbox role on physical servers as uh, databases for SQL server also on physical servers. We used to, but we were under real pressure. Go for virtualization. We don't care. The higher management, non-technical, they just say, get rid of those physical servers, right, as a policy. Is the option <laughs> so you got it? Hey, this is the other option only. There is no other option other than that. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Mm, actually, it's so. No, it is expanding, but this is long term solution, first of all. Second thing, everything, uh, they're not going away from virtualization, so they will be using it long term. Third thing, uh, yes, it can be moved or replicated. The, the other st uh, stuff is that you can replicate that as well, but the main thing is, no, it's not, you cannot call it temporary at all. You plan for it, and then it's executed, and then you stick with it. And so many, so many, in, this is being used in large uh, numbers in companies. Oh, it's common. You ask, uh, hey, you have password disk, or if you have a VMware environment, you ask uh, if you have uh, RDM. So it's the same thing there, right? Wise uh, uh, management. So, so if you just need the requirements. Yeah, that's the only scenario. But you're fixing a full run just for this. So I'm going to just show you now uh, what do I mean by that. So if I just uh, go to that, uh, you know, server two here. And uh, I have to re undo that as well later. So uh, if I just uh, go for one virtual machine here, uh, let me just put it on magnifier. So if I go for one virtual machine here and go to settings and go for our SCSI controller, especially our hard drive. So 
when I go to hard drive of this specific virtual machine, uh, there is that physical hard disk option uh, grayed out because it does not detect any unallocated space uh, extra physical disk here. So if I just add that physical disk now, you're going to see this option is uh, enabled. It's going to detect a full disk and it's going to, if I wanted to uh, attach, uh, I can attach that physical disk, put the operating system there and then uh, put uh, the application there as well. So let me just quickly uh, show that because it's just, uh, not a long lab, uh, it's a small demo only. So if I go for settings here just to add you know, suppose this is a physical disk, uh, but I'm gonna be showing it on a virtual environment. So if I just add a new disk, this is just like I've gone to the market and purchased a 200 GB uh, disk here, SSD disk. So if I just add that uh, in my VMware workstation virtual machine, uh, right now if I select this settings, so it is added as a second 200 GB disk here, right? So uh, if I now, I don't touch it anymore other than adding it, right? So it's like you went to the market and you, or from the vendor, you just uh, bought, got that disk, ordered that disk. Now, if I go to that virtual machine again, does it detect that? Does it detect uh, the physical disk? So now you can enable that, right? So it detects that there's an unallocated space and instead of this, now it's going for physical hard disk. Uh, here, this will guarantee all the performance and uh, if, of course it has to be SSD if you're really looking for performance there, right? So this is the pass-through disk option in the virtual machine. Oh, now you're getting physical disk, right? So it's like you you installed the whole thing on physical server. It's very useful, I'm telling you, I did that. <laughs> No, but inside virtual environment, you need more performance. And this is always the fight. We need more performance. We need more. We need more. Always they are pushing us. Like give us more performance. We're saying, hey, we're virtualized. For God's sake, give us a break. No, it's not a break. You have to still give performance. And you have to come up with all those solutions that gives performance, that optimizes, uh, intelligently uses memory and processing. Yeah? Yeah. So, no way so I couldn't say take a new part of this partition into two sections oh. and then use one partition for one virtual machine and the other partition for oh. the other virtual machine. So it has to be full oh, one so complete no unit. No, this is it. So what is that with the process? Sorry? No, this is this is the only disk that we have. And on top of so this is now like it has become a physical server now. Okay, so we have the we don't need that. Mm -hmm. Install operating system. Yeah, we don't need. And this will be. So remove it. Because. Mm -hmm. So we don't need that. So we remove it, right? Yeah. So this will become better. Why? Because you need performance. If you don't give performance, they will hire someone else who will give performance. So we need job, right? <laughs> This is the only way you can do it. If parent disk is slow, we don't care. We don't care about the parent disk, right? So, so this is VHD, which is a virtual disk. This is a physical disk, right? We get rid of virtual disk, we take a physical disk here, and it gives us performance. So we don't care about the parent disk. It becomes the parent disk. Yeah. So parent disk is not something compulsory. Whatever disk you want to make parent can become a parent disk, right? So it's not like uh, that is parent, no, don't touch it. We can remove it whenever we want. So it could be that, but main thing is, uh, if you get this, you're solving a lot of problems. You're making your boss's head. Hmm? Because pass-through becomes parent. You don't have to put something there, right? You leave the parent disk, you don't need the parent disk, 
you make that functionality happen on the pass through. But giving performance as well. Well, the scenario was we were not you, we, that server SQL server was not what just decided all of a sudden, right? Otherwise, this is planned. Oh, we need to install SQL server in a virtual environment. Go for password this now. Or if it was out of nowhere, it came to us. This is how we do it. It could be any scenario. You will have to face that. You know, managers say you have to do. Speed. speed. Need for speed. <laughs> when speed is something that gives you business. See this? The other disk is selected or done? No. So this is it. Yeah. This is the disk. Yeah. But So uh, that's what I'm trying to explain that, uh, you know, don't stick to the parent concept, parent and uh, slave, master slave or parent is child is. It is there in physical, but here in virtual environment, you can do many other scenarios that does not even involve parent child relation. Because we started off with saying parent, and then the Now we're saying that. This was for differencing this, right? Yes. If. So either you plan it already, and uh, maybe you create a new virtual machine with pass through disk from the start, okay. or if you are facing that scenario which we face so much, that if it's already there and we have to do it, we have no choice. Yeah. No. Uh, in production environment, we have no idea. How bad is this? You just do it. That's it. Mm -hmm. So, you're going to get fired a lot? <laughs> no, no. So, you cannot reason with bosses, right? They write your check. So, uh, we have to just say yes. That's all. Uh, okay. Uh, that's the reality of uh, our uh, job life. And let's go back to our... So, this is uh, how uh, physical disk is added. Otherwise, we're just going to go for virtual disk here. And yes, the whole disk is dedicated, no matter how much it costed you. So press OK here. Yeah, it's going to be uh, really a decision to be made. But yes, if that SQL Server after running gives you a lot of business, uh, so many databases of uh, other applications are there. Yes, it was all worth doing it. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, we can use that if we planned it, or if we, in the middle of something, if it came, we have to do this. Otherwise, we normally plan it. Yeah, yeah cool. create a new virtual machine, and just put it in path through this. We're done. Yeah. Yep. Of, you know, having extra work, then you have to, you know, you already need there, you Yep, you're right about that. Okay, so let's go ahead, guys. Uh, we're trying to go ahead. <coughs> but this is good. This is uh, a lot of questions coming, which is very, very good. So, yeah, you were saying? I hope so. You're good. <laughs> so, okay, guys. Uh, so, uh, I'm just going to fly by some of the simple topics uh, like creating virtual disk. And, uh, yeah, we went through that. Uh, there's nothing much there. Just save the. So, uh, this is fixed size, dynamically expanding, and then differencing. If uh, we can just go through any of those wizards. We went with the dynamically expanding. This is the most favorite to save storage. In uh, but uh, it's against you know if you want performance, it's fixed disk. If you want uh, space uh, saved, then it is dynamic disk, right? We talked about that. So let's go ahead a little. <coughs> excuse me. So we we went through this scenario. Normally it is not C drive. Normally it is some remote storage coming from EMC or Net App. So we're going to be later, uh, later we're going to be configuring that. So expect much, much, much longer labs and tougher labs. I was also told that don't put each and every step there. Uh, but right now, put each and every step so you get used to it. Then later, I'm told to challenge you guys, right? 
So some of the configurations which I think you can do and with all the hints and I was also told you guys should be googling uh, some of the stuff just to configure, just to figure out yourself uh, what to do. Yeah. Yeah. So we will be doing that anyway, right? So, but that will be coming later. Yeah. Sorry. No, no. Lab. No, it's lecture till five. Right. We can change that, but some of the student scenarios are students uh, have their own classes, right? Okay, guys. So let's go ahead. <coughs> And uh, yes, this is a space we're giving. Uh, this is thin provisioned already, so it's not gonna occupy the whole 127 GB right away. It is thin provision. It is not thick provision, right? No. So pass through topic is done. Yeah. We're moving to the rest of the slide here, and uh, here we're just going for uh, this uh, create a new blank virtual desk. Uh, so we did that today. Actually, uh, you missed that lab. So uh, I'm talking about today's lab. So uh, with uh, with this lecture and the lab manual, uh, it will perfectly make sense what we were doing and why we were doing that today, right? And yeah, you could just press it more. Oh, oh no, just kidding. So uh, let's just go ahead here. Uh, 107 GB, but it also says that if you have some remote storage, you can just connect that machine to that as well. And that would be our uh, professional approach to creating, uh, uh, you know, a physical uh, uh, private uh, cloud that we will have a remote storage. Uh, so let's go ahead. Editing a virtual disk to start the uh, edit virtual disk wizard. Uh, we tried to edit the virtual disk as well, and the options were compact convert, expand, merge was not there, uh, but uh, three options were there. Uh, compact applies to dynamically expanding and differencing virtual disks only. So you can make them compact, right? You save space by making them smaller, right? Uh, and you don't lose data as well, right? So it reduces the size of the dot VHD. What is, anyone knows, what is dot VHDX? Oh, or VHD? Virtual hard drive, uh, it has a configuration. Way to go. Perfect. So convert converts a dynamically expanding virtual hard disk to a fixed size virtual hard disk, or vice versa, right? So convert will convert uh, from dynamic to fixed, or fixed to dynamic, which means that from thin provision to thick provision, and from thick provision to thin provision, right? So convert will convert. Uh, either you need uh, a performance, you will go for fixed size, or either you need to save space, you will go for dynamically expanding, right? So expand so what does expand do the opposite of compact of course uh, increases the storage capacity of a dynamically expanding or fixed size virtual disk you want to increase the capacity uh, then and uh, we today's lab we did that too uh, we created that disk and then we uh, put the size to from 127 to 128 GB uh, we expanded that and then we saw the size that it was 128 GB or 130 GB 138 so yes, we can expand a working disk, a disk that is being used right now. Actually, better to shut down the machine and then expand it. So so compact is the one you would use the option for that. So it reduces the reduces the size of the hard disk. So, and merge applies only to differencing disks. Use this option to combine changes stored in a differencing disk with the contents of the parent disk. So, parent disk and differencing disk could be merged as well. Oh my God. Uh oh. This is it. Not me, Microsoft. Okay. So, but yeah, there are many features, and if we are knowledgeable administrators, we will know all the options we have and all the features we have, right? So, <coughs> if we have, uh, you know, that's why we need to know all the options. But uh, let's go ahead inspecting a virtual disk. This is what we did today as well. Uh, so, uh, inspect just tells us the information of a current disk. How big is it? Where is it located? And uh, what is the type of the disk here? Is it dynamically expanding or fixed? So inspect actually just gives us 
uh, full information about the current disk, right? So if we go ahead a little, this is what we did, uh, this lab also we did today. Uh, then we come down to virtual, uh, virtual network switch, and definitely the virtual machines have to talk outside, their data has to go outside the network. So if your switches are not configured properly, you're in big trouble, right? So the virtual switches have to be configured. So works like a physical network switch. Switch ports are added or removed automatically as virtual machines are connected to or disconnected from a virtual network. So virtual switch works like a physical switch and if you have the concept of virtual switch, physical switch, you just connect uh, the cable and that's it. The you know physical computers are talking to each other, pinging each other, sharing files with each other. So that's what virtual switch also does, right? So uh, virtual network switches, a system operating uh, after the Hyper-V role is installed. Uh, system operating, wow. Okay, the parent partition, host OS, is using a virtual network adapter, host OS uh, using a virtual network adapter, virtual machine is using the VM best to access the virtual network switch. So if I go to our uh, Hyper-V settings here, so if I right click, we went for virtual switch manager there, right? So if you go for external switch here, um, and uh, if you go for new virtual switch, so we have external, internal, and private. So external is, of course, if virtual machine is connected to external switch, it's gonna go, the data will go outside. If it is internal, the virtual machines will be talking or sharing files with each other and to the host only, right? Who's the host? Yeah, Hyper-V host. And then the private, which is uh, virtual machines only, can share files with each other, that's it. They, it's private means totally uh, restricted environment for the virtual machines, right? So, uh, <laughs> this could be, uh, well, it is 4,000. You can connect with other machines. Switch. Yeah, switch. But you can have two switches. So, so uh, you can have as many switches you want. Actually, 128. So, um, this is uh, the type of three switches. Then there is that area. So, first of all, different scenarios, different switches. We only connected external switch, right? Then we're going to be uh, checking the internal as well, where virtual machines can uh, share data with each other and to the host, uh, Hyper-V and private, where virtual machines share data only with each other. Then there's MAC address here. So anyone knows what is MAC address for? It's a unique identifier for your device building. Network adapter. So uh, virtual machines also have their virtual network adopter. So the always Hyper-V and other hypervisors like ESXi and uh, uh, you know Red Hat also has a hypervisor KVM. Excuse yeah. Me. Uh, external or physical disk, right? Uh, physical network adopter. So, and we can have 128 virtual switches per type. What should be the capacity of the basic uh, Capacity, well, it's 1 Gbps, 10 Gbps, it's up to you. Physical length. Then but de uh, definitely more bandwidth is required when you have such machines. Yeah, if you're using 4,000. Of course. Uh, but it, it depends on your memory. It can go up to that, but can you have that hardware? If you have one terabyte memory in your physical server, that server yeah, alone is twenty thousand dollar or thirty thousand dollar server. Just trying to figure out the one for yeah. a ratio for the yeah. if you're using physical how big should your battery for a certain amount of VMs? So this ratio is coming with the processor as well as in the slide. Uh, but uh, but we're just trying to uh, know what are the basics of virtual switches right now, right? And the MAC address, why would this range, MAC address range be there? We know the IP address range in DHCP, what, why there is a MAC address range here? So MAC address range is here because virtual machines could be created and deleted. Uh, they are virtual, so they're not physical that you have one fixed uh, MAC address with the network adopter, although you can change that too uh, nowadays. Uh, so. Virtual machines are given MAC addresses from within this range, right? So, uh, and you can change the range as well, but normally we are not supposed to touch this area at all. Yeah? Uh, the 
that Macros? Yeah. Um, it's dynamic. We can change the range here, but yeah, to the virtual machine, it, it has to be coming from here. So the yeah, Hyper V hypervisor gives the MAC address to a newly created virtual machine that will have a network adapter. Actually, we can change that address as well with a PowerShell command. Because it's virtual, we can most uh, mostly do anything we want with that virtual machine. So that's why there were so many options and you were saying, huh, that too. That. Because it's a software, we can do a lot. If it was hardware, then there are limitations. Right? Yeah. So, so we should be just knowledgeable about those options. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, uh, the virtual uh, switch manager can do uh, uh, three switches and MAC address range, that's what it offers there. But if we go ahead a little and try to uh, go for more topics here, um, if we go for uh, virtual switch settings, right now uh, a normal network adopter looks like this in a Hyper-V. But a network adopter that ha is being controlled or by Hyper-V or to the network adopter which Hyper-V is connected, it looks like this. So if I go back to uh, our uh, Hyper-V switch here, so uh, if I go for our virtual machine server 2 and to the network adopters in server 2 here, so we can click that. Now uh, there are two Ethernet adopters and uh, our uh, Hyper-V is connected to one of them. So uh, the, this V Ethernet is the external switch, right? And if we go double click that Ethernet, so we have properties here and then it looks like a normal switch. Otherwise it is a virtual network adopter that has been created and connected to a local Ethernet network card. So it looks like this, right? So if I cancel and close out from here, go for Ethernet 1, which is a separate network adopter we added in the server 2. So it is looking like a normal network adopter. If I go for the first adopter, just wanted to check the difference. So this one, all options are unchecked. So this is automatically done by the Hyper-V itself as soon as you connect a physical network adapter or virtual network adapter to a Hyper-V, so Hyper-V takes over. So this network adapter had the IP address, which now the Hyper-V switch, virtual this adapter uh, has that address now, which this Ethernet Zero used to have. So what happened? When you connected Hyper-V to this Ethernet Zero, it just you know, took over it, occupied it. So the network address is shown here. The normal settings are shown here. So this tells us that our Hyper-V is connected to only Ethernet 0 right now, right? It is not connected to Ethernet 1. Otherwise, Ethernet 1 would also not show normal IP addressing there uh, as in the properties here, right? So, so uh, whichever network card uh, uh, Hyper-V connects to, it just, uh, that network card, uh, you know, shows no settings because now Hyper-V is, uh, you know, taking care of those settings. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, this is default we created. Okay, so we just have to assign that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. The network adapter, right? So first time we did not went for the whole wizard. We just cancel out. We were just making sure that Hyper-V is installable. So we because we wanted to configure later everything. So that's why we left it in the first machine or template machine. Oh, you you configured it. Whichever is a available network adapter. And that time it was just one, right? So later we added the second one. So that's why it's uh, not showing the second time. So <coughs> let's go ahead a little 
and uh, go with our rest of the top it here. Oh, it's already full. So uh, here, types of virtual networks, uh, external virtual networks, internal virtual networks, private virtual networks. We just talked about that. Uh, that external uh, connects virtual machines to outside network. Internal connects virtual machines to each other and the host. And private just uh, connects virtual machines to each other only. So this is just for a testing environment, right? So creating a virtual network, uh, we went for network manager, and then we created that network card. Uh, we just uh, visited that area of MAC address as well, where uh, MAC addresses are automatically handled uh, by the hypervisor itself. So yeah, uh, we create a new network card like uh, with this wizard. So uh, here the screen shows private, but we went for external, and we just selected one network card there uh, in our today's lab. Creating and configuring virtual machines. Then we went for virtual machines creation. That's uh, you know simple, uh, nothing technical, much technical here. But new virtual machine wizard provides a simple, flexible way to create a virtual machine. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we went for uh, click to proceed, specify name. We gave name, but this is the store the virtual machine in a different location. This is where the uh, decision is that you want to go for local disk or you want to go for the SAN disks. If you have connected the SAN disks, then you can offer those disks here at the start of the wizard of creation of virtual machine, right? So, uh, but right now we just chose the local disks because we don't have SAN. So, uh, then comes the, <coughs> using the new virtual machine wizard, and uh, okay, still the same thing, memory 512. Now this is the screen that shows uh, Windows 2008 based Hyper-V, uh, but uh, uh, there was an option for dynamic memory here. And we should choose dynamic memory because uh, then whenever the virtual machine needs more, automatically that memory is provided uh, to the virtual machine by the hypervisor uh, unless we have put some limits there or uh, reservations. So right now, uh, yeah, it's a uh, 512 by default is uh, chosen there and with the dynamic memory option. That should be chosen in case you don't want that virtual machine to ask the uh, hypervisor to get more memory if it needs. Otherwise, uh, it's always good to have that dynamic memory option enabled. So assign memory, this is another option. Uh, the performance of the virtual machine will improve with additional memory. So if I just go to a virtual machine memory area, uh, there are many options there for the memory. Uh, so in server two here, uh, if we go for Hyper-V Manager, and here, virtual machine. So if we go to the settings area, and then memory area. So uh, we have many options here uh, that the slide is going to be discussing as well. Uh, so if you go to the memory option, there is a startup memory, how much memory you want for your initial uh, configuration, initial, initial starting up of the virtual machine. Then minimum RAM and maximum. So these are the reservation you're giving to those uh, through this virtual machine that hey minimum you will be getting 512 and maximum is this number MB so you just going for uh, uh, one terabyte uh, it is so you can make this number change uh, so maximum it can go for that our virtual machine our host only has 2 GB or 4 GB uh, you can give as much here but uh, if it uh, if the physical memory is there of course then it can reach there otherwise this number is just uh, of no use if you just put a random number here uh, but if you want to reserve that you don't you're not gonna go more than 2048. So if you reserve it like that, of course, then if it needed more memory, it's not going to be provided more memory. And that's a scenario that, and I don't know which scenario that I would restrict the machine to do that. Uh, otherwise, give it enough. And uh, Or if you want to restrict the non-critical machines to be asking more memory, so you could reserve those uh, uh, you know, for the critical machines, then you go for the scenario that, uh, oh, it's a web server, OK. Uh, maybe a virus attack happens and it starts using a lot of memory, it requests a lot of memory, and we're stuck with SQL Server and Exchange Server, which are asking for more memory and they don't have that, right? So in that scenario, you're going for uh, limiting the maximum and minimum for that uh, virtual machine. Otherwise, uh, it's okay, normal to give, uh, you know, uh, maybe 10,450, whatever. 
So whatever the number was there, if that physical memory is there, of course, then it will reach there. Otherwise, at least it is open uh, that if it needed more, it will get whatever the physical host can provide, right? So, uh, and memory buffer is, uh, again, uh, specify the percentage of uh, memory that Hyper-V should uh, try to reserve as a buffer. So uh, what it can reserve, so maybe this machine is important and you want to reserve some of it for it in in case when uh, you every virtual machine is fighting for the memory, right? So there are two virtual machines which really need the memory, but you have reserved here 20% of the memory has to be for this virtual machine. So no matter uh, how many other machines are requesting for memory, they are running out of it, this 20% will remain there of the physical. Uh, so the system will not take away this much memory uh, and it will reserve it for this virtual machine. You can, for non-critical machines, I would go for 5% here uh, or maybe 2% and I, for critical machines, I would just keep it 20 or 30 or 40 for all the critical machines that, hey, reserve it in the time of need. And when the time of need comes, uh, yes, the users start calling you that there's a very bad performance going on. I cannot open my file on that uh, file, uh, virtual machine. So you go and check those memories and then you try to reserve more. But it, according to the experience and it's a kind of an evolution that you try to know with experience that uh, what kind of memory for critical machines you should be giving. Uh, but these are the minimums and maximums and you're reserving this much percentage in case of uh, fight of memory or great requirement of memory is going on. System is running out of memory. Every virtual machine is looking for more memory or requesting more memory. And but you have reserved this much for this virtual machine. Maybe this is a very critical machine. So those uh, virtual mach other virtual machines will be not given at this uh, this much percentage of the total memory. So memory weight also is about priority. So if I go for memory weight and go for high priority, near the high priority, so whenever whenever there is a fight for virtual for memory by virtual machines, hey, I also need, hey, I also need, I also need. So if this has high priority, of course, it will be uh, given uh, or it will be first attended to and other virtual machines will be attended later. So it will be asked, hey, how much you need first? You're, you got the memory weight. Uh, close to high, so I'm, I'm supposed to ask you now because we are running really low on memory right now, so I'm going for those who are the privileged virtual machines. That how much you want, sir, or ma'am, okay. Virtual machine, actually. So, <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is all, uh, you know, strategy for virtual machine uh, memory that uh, you, we would learn according to the requirements and situations in peak times, Every day, we have to make sure that the critical virtual machines are getting their fair share and non-critical are not requesting unnecessary memory that is required for uh, critical uh, virtual machines, right? So uh, this is uh, the strategy that we should be going for um, in terms of uh, uh, you know, critical machines, going for more buffer and more weight and non-critical, uh, putting it to actually maximum reserve, minimum reserve as well. And then uh, it's continued here, assigned memory, uh, the performance of the virtual machine will improve. Uh, memory setting is a compromise between a larger memory location and the total number of virtual machines running on the Hyper-V. So every virtual machine always is fighting for memory. So you have to decide which virtual machine to give proper uh, memory and which virtual machine. You can just uh, give lesser memory, right? So it's our decision as a system administrator. So, uh, if we go for virtual machine wizard, there is that network card setting and we connected it to the external network card uh, and uh, then uh, user network uh, wizard requires two basic components. So configuring networking requires two basic components, network adopter and an available network. Of course, we had a network adopter and we created an external virtual switch. So uh, we're good with that. So. Using the new virtual machine wizard, then the next window allows you to add the first hard disk. Yes, it's gonna get, it has to have one hard disk, right? And it is .vhdx, not vhd. VHD is more on Windows 8 based, and vhdx is uh, 2012 based. And uh, this is a screen for the new hard disk. And 
then uh, we can uh, we today mounted this DVD to the <coughs> operating system so we could install the Windows. Uh, we had some problem uh, there, but uh, yes, uh, we figured it out. Uh, we had to uncheck the uh, secure uh, mode as well as put the DVD on top so it could just take that. So configuring virtual machines, then we started to, to go for configuring virtual machines. Now these are some of the extra options there. You want to add another hard disk. Uh, if you want to add another hard disk, go for a new hardware and then you can try to add one more, two more, three more IDE disks. Uh, or we did already talked about differencing as well as uh, uh, the pass through disk. Is that uh, Henry's or is it? Okay, so. Okay, because people might start throwing laptops at the, uh, you know, the. Just kidding. Just kidding. You think what? I mean, it's a black ops. Black ops? No, no, no. Laptops. Oh, <laughs> so guys, we can add other hard disks as well here, and they go by that rule of ID zero, ID one, ID two. So if I just go back to this wizard here, for or uh, this uh, Hyper-V machine here, so we have this SCSI controller here. We can add DVD drive, which is already added, which we added today and we can add other drives as well. So if we click uh, select the drive and click add, uh, then we have all the options here to add. Just create, click new and it's gonna create a new disk. Uh, or physical artist, we already talked about that. And we have SCSI controller and also these many ports are available, 63 of them. You can connect to any, uh, so virtual hard disk, this many can be added to the virtual machine, right? So in physical, uh, so you know, desktop for a server, of course, you can have 16, 24. Depends on the, you know, uh, what is the capacity of the server. But here in virtual environment, you can do a lot more, which you cannot do in physical environment, right? So this many hard disks you can uh, add there. <coughs> so uh, I'm just going to go ahead a little and. Uh, Adding hardware devices, so we can add SCSI controller, network adapter, uh, legacy network adapter. Uh, for uh, suppose you need to install, deploy an operating system from WDS or SCCM or over the network. If you want to deploy any operating system, you can go for virtual machine with a legacy network adapter that supports the Pixi boot uh, or pre-boot execution environment. So you can connect a virtual machine with that. Otherwise, normally we uh, just clone. Uh, machine from our image, uh, so we can deploy through WDS as well over the network as well. Uh, remote FX 3D video adapter you can add that for rich graphics experience for streaming applications uh, and for graphic rendering as well. You can install that adapter uh, if you have the physical server has that adapter, right? So this option requires that you run the uh, this uh, partial command to add this remote FX 3D adapter, right? So. BIOS settings, yes, we have the BIOS settings. We went there, uh, actually, the firmware. Uh, so virtual machine, but BIOS settings are there. So options are more narrow than the, that's, uh, okay. So then the options for a physical computer's BIOS. So options include turn on the non-lock feature on the startup, change the boot order for a network-based installation, move the ne legacy network adapter to the top of the boot order. So yeah, we have just those limited options there. We went to the firmware uh, and uh, there were just very limited options there. If we have the SCVMM, which is the central enterprise level application, then we have huge amount of options for any virtual machine uh, to uh, manage and maintain. So we have a lot of options. But there is that BIOS option here showing uh, NumLock can be enabled and the boot order, IDE, legacy. W well, this picture shows BIOS, but uh, uh, we have that same name in 2012 as firmware. So memory settings, virtual machines use the memory of the host computer, obviously. So there's a startup RAM, specify amount of memory needed to start the virtual machine. Well, startup says it all, right? Uh, maximum RAM, specify the maximum amount of memory that the virtual machine can use. Memory buffer, specify the amount of memory assigned versus the amount of memory needed. So what you assign there and what is 
uh, needed there. Uh, it, this is a buffer. The twenty percent is assigned there that could be needed when there is a real grab of memory uh, going on between all the virtual machines. At that time, that twenty percent will be assigned and will be available for that uh, uh, machine where you can configure that buffer, right? Mm -hmm. Just save there. So it's, it's reserved in case it's immediately accessible, and instead of uh, waiting for the commands to or the communication to go with the memory, uh, it's going to take time. So it's going to just keep that available for the memory. Okay. Mm. It's it's reserved. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't want to wait. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you for the correction. So, uh, specify the amount of memory assigned versus. <laughs> so, the correction is that a buffer memory is available uh, in case uh, it is required all of a sudden. And uh, you know it will take time to request that memory from the physical, uh, you know, from the hardware. So that buffer is available there to be used by that application. So there will be no degradation of application performance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah.